Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Servants. Today, we are going to be covering one of the most influential as well as mysterious characters that the Fate Canon has to offer. Yes, today's topic is one who may actually be the most important figure I have covered thus far for a variety of reasons, both historical and for gameplay. That's right, today we are covering the former and only Grand Assassin, Hassan Isaba. Design-wise, he is in my top 5. Lore-wise, he is fascinating. Historically, he's somewhat obscure, but amazing nonetheless. I would like to start off this video by giving a big shout out to Moon in the Discord for helping me out with some of the pronunciations for these names. I'm sure I will still butcher them, but I do appreciate her help, so shout out to Moon. Now, in Fate, he is given many names and no names at the same time. He refers to the Master of Chaldea as his contractor. He is referred to in-game as the Old Man of the Mountain, King Hassan, First Hassan, and affectionately Gramps by the community. His full name is Hassan bin Ali bin Muhammad bin Jafar bin al Husayn bin Muhammad bin al-Sabah al-Himyari, and he was the leader of a group known as the Nazari Assassins. But, let's go back and start at the very beginning. Now, I keep saying that Hassan Isaba is mysterious, and this is for good reason. Many of the first-hand records that we had on him either no longer exist, such as with his autobiography, or the texts he left behind are fragmented, as is the case with the treatises he wrote, which also no longer exist, but have been quoted and paraphrased by other authors. So, much of what we know about Hassan Isaba comes from outside sources and what is definitive in the historical record. The primary source used to view Hassan Isaba's early years comes from the Zargash Ziadinya. This puts him being born in Khan, Persia, or modern-day Iran, to a family of 12 Shia Islamics at about 1050 AD. His father was believed to be a Yemenite from Kufa in modern-day Iraq. At some point early in his childhood, his family moved to Shahar Are, which had a large Islamic population which seemed to influence the young Hassan Isaba. He became fascinated with the metaphysical and stayed at home studying the ways of mathematics, language, astronomy, and philosophy, amongst many other subjects. While Shahar Are was a hub for the Twelver sect of Islamics, it was also quickly becoming a hub for the Ismaili missionaries as well. This sect was in support of the Fatimid Caliphate of Cairo. In this sect, there were three levels one could be, the lowest being Fadayin, or foot soldier, then Rafiq, or comrade, and then at the top was the Da'i, or missionary. This new sect of Islam was growing to be more popular, due in large part to a growing unhappiness with the Seljuk rule, which was founded by the Sunni Muslims. This unhappiness could be contributed by the removal of local rulers in favor of a more dynastic reign. Hassan became acquainted with a Rafiq named Amira Darab, who would also be the one who would eventually convert Hassan. Hassan was intelligent and was initially skeptical about converting, but after spending time amongst other Ismaili, he made the decision to join them and swore allegiance to the Fatimid Caliphate at the age of 17. Hassan used this conversion to his own academic advantage and was able to study under two different Dayan, both of whom came to respect the young Hassan. Thanks to this, he was granted audience with Abdul i Malak ibn Atash, the chief missionary of the region who was also very impressed with the young man's devotion and intellect. So impressed was he that he made Hassan a deputy missionary and urged him to go spread the good word in Cairo, Egypt, where he could further broaden his horizons. Some sources indicate that Hassan's willingness to travel may have come from an anti-Fatimid group in Ray who had caught wind of the young intellectual's conversion. So, his traveling to Cairo may have been doubled as an escape from Ray. Regardless, we know that he set out for Cairo in 1076, and it took him two years to get there. This was not through a fault in navigation, but rather, he wished to see more of the world. He met up with other missionaries in Isfahan, then to Azerbaijan, then to Armenia. Unfortunately, here he was driven out due to his religious beliefs and a conversation he had with a priest. From Armenia, he went to Iraq, Damascus, then Palestine, before finally departing to go to Egypt. We are unaware of how long he spent in Egypt, but normally it is speculated that he remained there for three years, and was given the title of a full-on missionary. However, as tends to happen when preaching about religion, he attracted the unwanted attention of Cairo's chief of the army, a man named Badr al-Jamali. The real reasoning for this is unknown, but it is assumed that it is due to political reasons that the ire came about. Al-Jamali was in support of the Nizar, a member of an opposing caliphate to the Fatimid. As a result of this, Hassan was captured and imprisoned. He was held until a part of the jail collapsed and Hassan was granted freedom, as this was seen as divine retribution for his unjust capture. However, he was still deported from Egypt, and the ship that he was traveling on then wrecked. He would be rescued in Syria and left for Aleppo to Baghdad, and finally stopping in Isfahan in 1081. At this point, Hassan believed himself to be on a mission from the Divine, and traveled around Persia teaching and preaching to others. 
he began working in the Alborz mountain range, which had people who had traditionally resisted outside influences, but seemed to welcome the charismatic and wise Hassan. This information fell into the lap of a man named Nizam al muk who is cited as being one of the leaders who wanted Hassan captured years before in Rai. He now wanted Hassan imprisoned again, and sent soldiers to capture him. In response, he receded further into the Alborz mountains, and began searching for a place to reside. He found such a place in 1088, in the form of the castle of al -Mut. This was a fortress built to overlook a large valley in a place known as Vrdbar. Now Hassan took this fort for himself in a very strategic way. He sent other missionaries under him into the villages of the valley and became acquainted with the village people. He slowly managed to convert the villagers until in 1090, he and some of his cohorts infiltrated the castle and showed a draft drawn of the fort and essentially an IOU from a rich landlord. Hassan instructed those in the fort to go seek the man for the payment, and to everyone's surprise, he paid the amount in full. Thus, they gained a base of operation. Now, another story of how they claim this castle is that Hassan approached the owner and offered him 3,000 gold dinar to purchase as much land as would fit in a buffalo hide. The castle's owner agreed, believing this was going to be a pretty cheap deal, and Hassan then cut the hide into thin strips and circled it around the entire fort before tying it into a ring, and thus, they came to get the castle. This one is probably not true, but serves as a good lesson as to why you should not be greedy. Legend has it that after Hassan claimed this castle, he devoted himself entirely to his studies and practice of the faith, only ever leaving his area in the castle twice to go to the roof. Now, this is highly unlikely for a number of reasons, not the least of which is his own historiosity. However, we do know that he spent a considerable amount of time devoted to his own education, and was able to quote lengthy passages from the Quran, and was incredibly well versed in all aspects of mathematics and science for the time. Hassan Isaba had enough influence that he made a declaration that Persian is to be the holy language used by the Nizaris, and from then on, all Nizari Ismaili in Syria, Central Asia, Persia, and Afghanistan accepted this and changed the text to Persian. I want you to think about this for a moment. One man on a mountain's decision to use a central language for holy text was taken completely seriously and accepted. The amount of respect he must have held for this to have happened is somewhat unreal. From this new vantage point overlooking the valley, Hassan would further expand outwards, claiming 20 more castles and officially being recognized as having his own state, and he began minting his own coins. This became known as the Nizari State. While there was some resistance, the guidance of Hassan Isaba managed to thwart any plans of usurpation. But there is something that has had a significant lack of screen time for this video. Assassins. Hassan Isaba is the former Grand Assassin in Fate, and his chair is one that shall remain dormant until further notice, for none have surpassed him in efficacy. Well, here lies the issue. There are no recorded documents of Hassan Isaba performing an assassination. So then why is it that he held the grand title? Well, it's twofold. It was how he ruled as the Lord of Alamut and his perception from the outside of the Middle East. People like Marco Polo described him as a master manipulator and a leader of a band of charlatans who would go and kill their lords and then themselves. However, despite this, there are records of him having an impressive library and cutting-edge scientific developments for the time. But where did this conception come from? Much like all things in history, it is multifaceted. One is that he ruled in a very puritanical way, and held all of those around him to the same standard at which he held himself. This included the supposed execution of his two sons for the acts of murder and drunkenness. Two, his method of assassination is one that was similar to martyrdom. Keep in mind that he operated during the times when the Crusades were first ramping up, so foreign invaders could come to witness what they viewed as barbaric assassinations. This is because followers of Hassan in these scenarios were incredibly effective, gave their own lives for the cause, and would use a special herb to steal themselves for the task at hand. This herb was known as hashish, or as we commonly call it, weed, marijuana, or cannabis. These people became known as hashishin, or users of hashish, which in turn would be what led to the word that we use today, assassin. It is from Marco Polo that we get the anecdote of the training of the young assassins. As children, they would be brought to Alamut, and allowed to live in a beautiful garden with hashish and anything that they desired so long as it wasn't sinful. Then, at a certain point, they would be introduced to Hussan Isaba, who was more or less seen as a divine messenger. Then, the would-be assassins would be removed from the garden and put into a dungeon, and told that if they wished to return to paradise, they had to follow the words of Hassan exactly. What level of authenticity this has behind it is unknown, so take it with a grain of salt. The majority of assassinations that were done by Hassan Isaba and his followers were for religious and political purposes, but from an outside perspective, they were viewed as drug-addled miscreants high off of hash and a promise of paradise after death. You know, in other words, the exact same things the Crusaders were on, but through a different lens and with less Mary Jane. History is amazing like that. Finally, in 1124, Hassan Isaba succumbed to illness and passed away. 
He left behind a legacy that would last 166 years, a state that he himself had built from the ground up, and a syndicate of assassins that followed his doctrine. It took the invasion of the Mongols to finally destroy his state. And this is where the historical part ends and the fate part begins, because Sasani Saba's fate portrayal is something unique. For one, who we summon in fate might not even be Hassan Isaba at all. It is stated in game that none of the other 18 old men of the mountain actually know his true identity. We are making the assumption it is Hassan Isaba because he is described as the first Hassan. But he also fits in historically in a sense then as the Hassan who kills Hassans. He is not one to go out and enact executions on his own, but rather kills those who strayed from the right path as he did with his own sons. But his appearance in lore and fate helped to identify him as having some connection with the divine, namely the angel of death Azrael. The connection he holds to this angel is speculative at best, but our evidence comes from him residing in the shrine of Azrael in the sixth singularity, as well as it being the name of his noble phantasm. But here's where it gets tricky. In fate, Hassan Isaba was around for those whole 166 years of his state's creation, watching over the subsequent old men in the mountain and executing them once they strayed. He was able to last this long because at some point he reached the valley between life and death, meaning that he now walks forever in a place being not dead, but also not alive. We aren't really given context as to why, outside of his Bonsi E declaring that he no longer had anything left to teach, and after watching the evening bell for so long he seems to have ascended. As a result, he now acts at the will of the heavens, and is able to show even those who are immortal what it means to die. So I've got some time left and probably won't cover these characters individually, so I will do so now. The three Hassans we have in game are Hassan of the Cursed Arm, Hassan of the Hundred Personas, and Hassan of the Serenity. R.I.P. Hassan of the Intoxicating Smoke, I'm not covering you. All of them have some interesting historical tidbits attached to them, but not enough for an individual video. Starting with Cursed Arm Hassan, he is the most well known of all of the Hassans in Fate for his various appearances throughout the franchise. He is especially known for his massive bandaged arm, which is also his noble phantasm. His, as well as all other normal Hassan's noble phantasms, share the same name of Zabaniya, which comes from the Quran and are the tormentors in Hell. Cursed Arm Zabaniya comes from him having tricked a great demon and severing its arm before grafting it onto his own body. This demon was none other than Shaitan. Cursed Arm is able to control the demonic arm thanks to a curse that he himself has put onto it. We see this with his fight against Tristan in Camelot, where he severs the arm which summons the demon, who consumes the sad archer, and then attempts to do the same to Cursed Arm. That is, until Hassan Isaba shows up and slays the demon, then permits Cursed Arm to continue to live as Gramps killed the Cursed Arm. He is then commended for being the only Old Man of the Mountain to leave the Order of Hassans and survive. Next is the Hassan of a Hundred Faces. The main body for her is believed to be named Asako, or at least that's what I'm gathering from Capsule Servants in the Tight Moon Wiki. She has multi-personality disorder, which manifests as her being able to make 100 other Hassans to fight with her. Each one specializes in one specific category, and together they all work as a well-tuned unit, able to overcome any obstacle. It should be noted that each personality operates as its own individual, and information is not directly shared between them, and if Asuka were to have a wish on the Holy Grail, it would be to be one unified assassin, that way she can effectively utilize the abilities of all of them as one whole unit. Finally, we have the Hassan of the Serenity. This is the one that I find the most interesting because she actually has a historical background. She is said to be a Vishna Kanya, or a poison girl. These are girls whose bodily fluids and blood were said to be made of a potent poison. This is supposedly from a practice of raising girls by feeding them light amounts of poison and antidote, so that it eventually just naturally became a part of their body. Mind you, this killed most of them, but those that survived would be able to use these tools for murder. They would be sent to rivals as sexual offerings of peace, and once the deed commenced, the opposing party would die from the poison. There's even historical evidence to support that these girls did in fact exist, and result in the assassination of some ancient leaders of India. They would naturally be trained in the art of seduction, which helps to explain why Serenity's design and personality and fate are like that. But that's it. Hassan Isaba and the other members in the books. Thank you all so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. Like this video as it really does help out the channel. Comment who you want to see in the next video down below. Subscribe to catch these as they go up. Follow my Twitch and VOD channel for less structured content. Join the Discord and my Twitter. All links are down below, but for now, keep your chin up. Peace.